thank you everybody for coming. I'm very, very happy um, to see all of you here. I was born in St. Paul, Minnesota. I was one of six siblings. My mom and my sister and brother are here tonight. I grew up in the Midway area of St. Paul and I went to Hancock Elementary School. I remember very clearly in fifth grade, I did a drawing of a prairie on butcher paper with color crayons and the image emerged as I drew, and I, I had the idea that I could make light hitting grass by putting different colors next to each other in just uh, strokes. So I would make a mark with the yellow, and then next to it put a green, and that sort of thing. And then in the sky, I remember having the idea I could make milkweed seeds floating through the air almost like parachuters coming down out of the sky. And my homeroom teacher really liked the drawing and she submitted it to a citywide art competition, the Schweigert Meat Company Art Awards, and it won. And uh, then when it came back to the school, it came to my homeroom um, and Mr. Johnson called me back to his desk and he said, it says here, um, this piece won, this drawing won first prize, but I'm looking at it and I feel like there must be some kind of mistake. I don't see how this drawing could have won anything. And if you're an artist, you understand um, that this is a fairly regular pattern, uh, maybe a little harsh for a fifth grader, but throughout my whole career, I, I still really love making art. And it's that first part that I like, the image emerging as I work and I have ideas and I follow my intuition. And I try and focus on that and let the other things fall away. I went to Wilson Junior High School and my big passion in, then was wrestling and working out. And I got a gym membership and I worked out every day. And I was good enough by ninth grade where I was wrestling on the St. Paul Central varsity team. And this continued through high school. And I feel like it had a big effect later on because it's very difficult to paint every day. It requires a lot of endurance and concentration. And when I was doing some of these large paintings that took two or three years to make, I don't feel like I would have had the endurance without developing this habit that I continued through my whole life of uh, working out every day and staying in shape. It really helped me be able to focus. When I was a senior in high school, I got a really severe shoulder injury and it took me almost a year to be able to lift my arm above my head again. And I filled this void by doing drawings and paintings every day. And um, all of the energy I was putting into working out in sports, I now put into making drawings and paintings. At this time, too, I go to see my first art show, I take a bus to the Walker Art Center and I see an exhibition by Picasso. It's a retrospective. And I remember that what I really enjoyed and liked was how he changed from one thing to another, how he was always um, exploring and trying to discover different things. And I think that affected me through my life too. I, I felt like that was an admirable way to work. I went on to Bemidji State University. I had a really good teacher there named Marley Call. And after two weeks of uh, going there, he actually gave me a key so I could come in and work any time. Sometimes I worked all night long. And the way he, he taught me was is he would just leave stacks of books whether they were um, paintings, images of paintings or artists or poems. And he would leave them in my little studio space 
and I would read them and look at them, and then we would talk about what he left, um, the two of us. And at, at Bemidji, I also studied photography and ceramics and uh, life drawing, and I took art history classes. And the one that really stood out to me was um, Asian landscape paintings, uh, generally ink on paper. And what I really loved about these pieces were the, the figures were very small and they blended into the landscape. And sometimes you had trouble even finding them. And this had a big effect on me and I think on my work later on. Um, and I really liked too how the landscape was big and it had the feeling that it could keep going off of the edge of the paper in many cases. After going to Bemidji for two years, I was it was the end of the academic year and Marley came and got me and there was a phone call for me in his office and the phone call was uh, me being informed that my brother Scott had been killed in a car accident. And I went back to St. Paul and then I just couldn't come back to Bemidji. I just, um, just the idea of going back to the place where I got that call was too much for me. And I transferred to the University of Minnesota. And the painting course I had at the University of Minnesota, if you were an outsider walking in, probably looked a lot like a Monty Python sketch. And I was John Cleese in the background. It was a very idyllic setting. People had their easels in a semicircle around a still life piece that had a bust of Aristotle or an apple or a glass or a bottle of wine. And they were sketching away from their point of view and the professor was giving little hints on shading and that sort of thing. And I was used to working on my own and I had gone to the to the metal yard and bought some four by eight sheets of aluminum that w were just thin enough where I could bend them. And I was in the background of this um, sort of movie set scene of a art class kicking and banging and hammering uh, sheets of aluminum and then painting on them with cans, gallon cans of enamel paint and, and uh, house painting brushes. And I was a big distraction and the, the painting professors didn't want me around. And I got moved around and I ended up in the uh, foundry in the sand pit. There was a very uh, good artist and teacher that worked in the foundry. His name is Wayne Potras. And he let me work down there even though I didn't have any sculpture credits um, in his space. And the year I spent at the University of Minnesota, I actually uh, spent all the time working down in the sculpture space. Uh, after I was there for a year, I made the decision, I didn't have very much money, that I would spend the money on getting a studio and doing my own work. And I found a studio in downtown St. Paul. It was a building full of artists. It was a very creative place. Uh, the Wall Street Art Collective was there. And I ended up next door to a really wonderful artist and person, uh, Stephen Woodward. And Steve was very inspiring to talk to. He was very passionate about his work and about art and about travel. And I feel like he became a mentor of mine. And, and he infected me with his, his passion and his love of art and travel. Because I wasn't a student anymore, I could also apply for now for grants and fellowships. And I applied for a fellowship from the Jerome Foundation. And the, the committee came to my studio to look at my work. And on that committee was Elizabeth Armstrong, who uh, curated this exhibition. And they gave me the grant, and uh, Liz offered me an exhibition at the Walker Art Center where she was working as a curator. Uh, one thing about the building that I was in is we all had leases, but the landlord wanted us out. And uh, I think this is typical for many artists. And what he did was he turned the boiler all the way up. And for several days, it was intensely hot. And we didn't know what was going on. And um, then the boiler broke. 
we were told it could have exploded. I mean, the whole building was wood, even the stairs. So it was a, a big risky situation that the landlord put us in. But we all had to move. And I ended up in downtown Minneapolis. And I finished my Walker Art Center show there. And it's where I met the gallery dealer, Todd Boakley. Todd and I did a show a year for, I think, six years at his space downtown in the Wyman building. And the first bank at that time was uh, collecting art. They had a really good curator and she was buying nationally and internationally. And she bought one of my pieces and uh, put it in their tower in downtown Minneapolis. And the, the people on the floor where my painting was didn't like it. And there was a program there where if you didn't like the paintings, you could vote it to a different part of the building called Controversial Corridor, where I think nobody worked. But this worked out for me because I went there to give a talk about the painting. And uh, Mike and Charlene McHugh were there. And um, we became lifelong friends and they became um, collectors of my work then. And they still are to this date. And I'm very, very grateful to them for their support and you never know how things are going to work out in the end you know um at this point i start traveling a lot i travel to mexico i travel to mexico city i want to see the murals there and i travel to all the public spaces and around town and i fall in love with the the painter orozco i found his paintings incredibly mysterious and beautiful and I, re- and I really love them. I, I went to Egypt, I crawled through the pyramids, I went all the way down the Nile into the Sudan, I crisscrossed all the countries in Europe, and ended up in Venice, uh, standing in front of the great Tintoretto painting of the crucifixion. And it had some of the qualities that I liked in the Asian landscape paintings that I saw in school, but it was a really big scale. But it it felt, had that feeling like it could go off of the canvas in all directions. And it had this really complicated sense of space where you couldn't quite grasp all the points in space in it. And um, the movement was quite amazing. And I stood for about three hours looking at this painting. And it influenced all the large-scale paintings I did afterwards, trying to get that feeling of of just the the detail and the movement, and then that it was going off of the edges of the painting. When I got back to Minneapolis, I got a new studio in Northeast Minneapolis. And when I was traveling, I saw lots of history paintings, large scale history paintings. They tended to be localized for where they were. So if you were in Paris at the Louvre, there would be uh, history paintings of Napoleon. And I felt like there was room for me to do a history painting that was based on where I lived in the Midwest. And I decided to do a painting of a a field of dead buffalo. Uh, And the number of buffalo went to infinity was my basic idea. And I did this painting without looking at photographs and I I went back to the drawing I did in fifth grade and I actually used the same idea about painting the grass and it went off of the sides on every edge and it was, um, you know, meant to be a field of infinite dead buffalo. That's the history that I grew up hearing um, about when I grew up here in, in the Midwest. At this point, my son Madison is born He's always climbing up a refrigerator or like Mount Everest or something. And I can't, I can't do another large scale painting at the time, but I'm lucky enough to know this wonderful printmaker and artist, Ruth Ann Gadelli, and she's a professor at McAllister College. And she taught me how to do monoprints at the university on her press in her space. And I would go in at night for a few hours. You have to do monoprints fairly quickly. And I would do um, monoprints. The imagery was mostly children. And that's what my life was at that point. And then the children evolved into the father and son paintings. And it was primarily memories 
of me with my father in different situations. But the, the pictures of those situations coming into my mind's eye um, when I took my own son to some of the same places. So if I went up to their lake cabin or something, I would have this memory or this image in my mind. And I didn't use photographs or sketch or anything. I just worked from the images I had in my mind. And um, I, did, I did this series and as I was finishing the series, I read a short story by um, the the writer, the great Argentinian writer, um, uh, no, by Franz Kafka. And uh, Kafka wrote a short story about a, bansi- a dancing dog, um, and it was from the dog's point of view, and the dog wore a tutu, and it danced on its hind legs when a uh, its partner, the organ grinder, turned the crank and people would throw money into a hat. And it, the dog kept thinking that who he was, in large part, was based on how he got his food and where his food came from. And I shut my eyes and I can see in whole images and actually slideshows of images. And I was letting this sort of slideshow run through my mind's eye and this image of the infinite chickens appeared in my mind and I decided to paint it and it took about three years. It was uh, very important to me that uh, in this painting that every chicken be different. I mean, it's set up in an impossible situation because the last 10 inches or so, the chickens have to become just tiny dots and even with like a 10 magnifier on, I, I couldn't make them different. But I had a sense already, I think, that every living thing is a variant, a variation. It sim- we're, it's similar, but they're not the same. And that's the, one of the main feelings that I wanted from this, from this painting. While I was doing that painting, I also did a series of drawings. Um, my father is a botanist and he studies the evolution of plants and through through the study of pollen. And what he would do, what his passion was, was to walk around in the woods with his books on plant identification. And they were just full of drawings. They weren't photos at the time, they were drawings of, of flowers and different kinds of plants and animals and even birds. And I would look through them and my mind was full of these images of different types of plant, of different plants. And when I first looked at the humanistic drawings of people like Albrecht Dürer, I really loved them. And, 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 but instead of studying nature, what I decided to do was do a kind of study of my own imagination and let the information I already had in my head come out. And I just uh, drew these kind of plants and animals And then whenever I had an idea of something, I would just write it down, and that was the environment that the drawing existed in. Um, At this time, too, there's computers are just starting to come into being, Um, home computers. I trade a painting to Douglas Oakley for for a um, computer, and there was this new invention then called the CD-ROM. And it had, I don't know how many, like 60,000 books on it, um, going back to ancient Greece primarily, and up to, you know, about Walt Whitman in the, in the Western tradition. And I decided what I would do would be to study something that was impossible to know, and I studied beauty. And I put in beauty as the key word, and I read for about six to eight months, I can't remember exactly, all the all the entries that came up um, with with the word beauty in it, and so that's the one place where the text didn't come to me almost like a Rorschach test or something. I printed out uh, segments through history on what uh, different cultures and uh, different time periods had to say about beauty. At this time, I get a call from New York. It's a art dealer on 57th Street at a gallery called Associated American Artists, Emilio Steinberger, and he asks if I want to do an exhibition. 
And we do an exhibition of these imaginary scientific drawings. And we go on to do, I think, three more exhibitions at this space in New York. I also read at, at, at this point another short story. It's a short story called The Library of Babel. It's by the Argentinian writer Borges. And it, um, the story is basically, you, you have these 26 letters and you can take them and recombine them and recombine them and make an infinite number of books. And this library of his, he describes the architecture in detail, but it basically goes to infinity in all directions because there's infinite number of books. Um, and so I do a painting of books. Mine has no architecture. It's just this huge pile of books. And it, it comes from the internet just starting, trying to trying to get a grasp on all the new knowledge that's happening and coming into the world at the same time that there are these, you know, CD-ROMs with 60,000 books that no one could ever read. And the idea of trying to know and understand everything and understand the world feels like an impossibility. And I wanted that kind of feeling in the painting that I did of the books. At this point, I'm lucky enough to win the Rome Prize. I go to Rome and live for a year. The project I had in Rome came from a completely different place than anything else I've ever done. I had an experience that never repeated itself. I was standing up on the scaffolding uh, in my studio working on painting tiny dead buffalo as I neared the horizon line of my infinite dead buffalo painting. And I turned around and my dead brother Scott was standing there watching me. And uh, we had a conversation. And uh, I asked Scott what it was like to be dead. And he told me he couldn't uh, feel a breeze on his skin anymore. And he missed it. He missed that feeling. And uh, he told me I had to live for both of us now. And then he vanished. And... I did a painting in Rome of leaves, of course, every leaf different, about two or three inches in size, moving in space in different ways. But the main thing I wanted out of this painting was it to feel like there was a breeze going through the leaves. Um, and it took the whole year I was in Rome to do the painting. When I was in Rome, I met all kinds of amazing people in all different fields. And um, Peter Boswell was the art director at the time, and he introduced me to all kinds of amazing artists like Jim Dine and Martin Purrier. And one of the people I met there who was a fellow at the same time as me was Mary Margaret Jones. And after my year in Rome, I went back to Minneapolis for a year, and then I moved to San Francisco where Mary Margaret and I were married. And a lot of the work I did after that in San Francisco, I could not have done without Mary Margaret's support. And I'm very, very grateful to her for all the support she gave me. One of the things we did when we were fellows at the American Academy in Rome is we took a long trip through Syria. We traveled around the whole country. We went to places that are destroyed or partially destroyed now, like Palmyra in Aleppo. One of the things that stood out to me was there was no advertising. There weren't pictures everywhere. Every single image was a picture of the dictator, Hassaf Assad. Some of them were like 80 feet tall, it seemed like. Every store had a picture. Even the graffiti, there was a stencil of Assad's face, and people would spray paint his face on the side of buildings, and that was the graffiti. And when I was finishing the chicken painting, people were coming in, and they were picking out their favorite chicken. And in some cases, they picked the same chicken. This bewildered me because I thought I wanted them all different, but I thought they were all the same at the same time. I didn't realize any would stand out. So I started painting this chicken. I called it the chosen one. And in the painting, I think it's about three inches high. And then I decided what I would do is like the, the big Assad ones, I would blow it up really big. And I made uh, three of these that were, I think, about 12 feet tall. 
of this ch chicken and I made a bust and I made the backgrounds different in the Assad pieces. He, it would be his same body, but then the backgrounds would change. And I was also thinking of Andy Warhol and his large paintings of Chairman Mao. And I did these uh, three individual chickens, the chosen one, and the art collector, uh, Jerry Kafeshian, bought them from me. He also bought the infinite chicken painting, and he did an exhibition of all of these paintings at his museum in Armenia, the Kafeshian Museum of Contemporary Art. And I'm very grateful for that show, and I'm very, very grateful um, to the support he gave me in, in buying the work. And now the family has um, loaned the painting for this exhibition here of the infinite chickens, and I, I th thank them for that. I um, decided I really liked this image, and I wasn't thinking about Assad anymore. I was thinking more about the um, character Don Quixote, and it, you know, this image, once you blow it up, it's a little cockeyed, it's kind of goofy. It's not trying to be liked very much, um, and I liked this personality as a personality for a painting. And I, I did a series of paintings where I would just change the background. I was thinking of it more as a character like Don Quixote. Pardon how I pronounce anything in any other language. I'm really horrible at, uh, at other languages. But I would just change the background. And I did these paintings for a few years, and I really quite liked them. And then one day I read a story in the New York Times about how they had extracted um, DNA from the femur bone of a Tyrannosaurus rex. And the Tyrannosaurus rex's closest living relative uh, was a chicken. It wasn't birds in general, it was a chicken specifically. And I had this idea of giving, giving my character language and the, the quote that I gave it in the very first one was, I ain't no chicken. And I didn't want to hand draw the letters. And I researched online and found a place called the Mad Stencilist. And I ordered the stencils from him. And um, I did a whole variety of these pieces. And when the stencils came, they still had the letters inside the stencil. And so I would take a little tweezers they were on vinyl, one side was sticky. They were sort of like for sign paint signs and things. And I would pull the letter out and just stick it to the wall and stick it to the wall I, and they would be random. They wouldn't be in any order anymore. And I did this, I did these pieces for about a year or a year and a half. And then one day I looked at the wall and I thought, wow, this is amazing. I've made a universe out of letters and I thought about letters as basic building blocks, the way atoms are basic building blocks um, for the material world. And I had these whole universes where the letters were themselves uh, the stars. And I, I thought this was beautiful and poetic and I was doing these paintings and it inspired me to start studying language. And so I started doing online courses about the history of language um, the history of writing systems, the history of the English language. And the thing that I learned that I probably should have known that I didn't know is that languages are always in flux and changing. And, you know, in the same way that uh, we know now that dinosaurs basically didn't go extinct, many of the, many of the dinosaurs evolved into birds they have 46 chromosomes. Those chromosomes rearrange themselves in different ways, almost infinite number of ways. The same way in the Library of Babel, you can rearrange those letters in an infinite number of ways for Borges to create this infinite library. And I decided I wanted to try and make paintings that reflected that kind of flux. And so I, at this point, I'm making all my own stencils. I don't repeat any stencils, and I'm making thousands and thousands of letters, and I'm trying to create this feeling of movement and the overall picture, but then when you look at it in detail, you can see these basic building blocks, these letters. Um, I did the painting for him in Magnum that's in the show here, and Genesis, based on this idea 
of trying to create this feeling of movement in languages. Um, I mean, the most obvious example of how this works and how everything is changing is during the Roman Empire, they expanded all the way into Europe, um, the provinces. And it was it's interesting to read some of the letters where Romans come out from Rome and visit the far ends of their colonies. And they write back um, that the r incredibly ignorant people are living out on the edges of their empire. They, their Latin is horrible. They, their grammar is terrible. And they can't really understand what they're saying anymore. And of course, uh, it's going through a change. And Latin at this point is evolving into Spanish and French and Italian and Romanian, and completely different languages. And the thing to keep in mind is this is happening to all languages all the time. Um, and I wanted to reflect that. And uh, I do these paintings. And Emilio, at this point, I send a picture to Emilio. And uh, he has a new gallery in the Rockefeller Center. And uh, he shows for him in Magnum there. Uh, that night at dinner, I'm sat next to uh, the art dealer and collector, Asher Edelman. And Asher and I go on to do four exhibitions at his gallery on the Upper East Side, one every year for four years. And Emilio's gallery moves to Chelsea, and he does an exhibition of four large-scale paintings. His idea was one on each wall. And it's part of the buzz around all of this where I'm able to get the commission um, for the lobbies in the World Trade Center. And Asher shows a painting out in the Hamptons, Catch My Drift, which is in the show. And the art collectors, Mary and Howard Frank, see it there and, and buy the painting. And we become friends. And we have um, something in common, which is, is we all love Venice. And so when I do my uh, Venice Biennale exhibition, in 2015, they were major supporters of the show. And Mary's a scholar who, who studies Venice and writes about Venice. And she wrote the essay for my, for my uh, Biennale catalog. And she wrote an essay for the catalog for this exhibition. And I'm very grateful to them for their friendship and their support and Mary's scholarship. I get the idea this time that even the past is in flux. I have all these favorite paintings of mine from the past. I see them you know, being made at a specific time in history, and so they're like mile markers to the past. But then I see that they're, being, they're never being the same by new generations. As new generations come along, they see them differently. And I wanted to reflect this kind of um, movement that not even the, the past was stable, that it was in flux. And so I took these paintings and repainted them. And I, I floated a veil of letters over them. So you would have to look through this veil of letters to me that I was hoping would create this feeling of movement and change and vibration. And that, that these images were being interpreted and reinterpreted over and over again and never seen the same as when they were first initially made. At this point, the pandemic hits. I um, have been making all of my own letters for many years and um, I, I get sick of it. I'm in the studio, I'm in lockdown, basically living by myself. And I decide to go back to that, that same kind of roots, the same kind of roots that uh, I did back in that drawing in fifth grade and just get my materials. I put about 10 canvases up and I just started working and, and just spontaneously to see what would happen. And what emerged was this new series of fish school paintings. Again, every fish is uh, different and every fish is similar. Everything is a variant and nothing is the same. And it pushes out to the edges like the other pieces. And that's where I'm at now. I'm still doing these paintings of the fish schools. And, um, you know, I hope when you walk through the show, you experience each work individually, but you also get a sense of my mental leaps and changes. And, you know, 
not literally a life lived, but a, a feeling of the kind of changes of, of, a, of an arc of a life um, in the same way that I did when I first walked through that Picasso show when I was 17. I want to say one thing about my uh, good friend, Claude Peck. Claude, I first met when I was working on the chicken painting, and Claude was interviewed me for an article in the Minneapolis St. Paul magazine, and uh, we became friends, and he's been collecting my work ever since. And he was the driving force behind the book that's the catalog for this exhibition. He worked on it for years. And I'm very, very grateful to Claude for all of his work. I'm very grateful to the Weissman Museum for putting on this show. Uh, thanks to everybody here who worked incredibly hard, Diane and Rosa and um, Patty and uh, Alejandra, thank you very much. And of course, thanks to Elizabeth Armstrong for agreeing to curate this exhibition. I'm very grateful.